you got your Bible this morning, we're going to go to Joshua chapter 2. Um, I really feel like I have a word from God. And I want you to know, uh, some people think that you have to be super serious the whole time, but I do believe this, that God's anointing fits you. And David, D- David teaches us that even the greatest, most expensive armor, our seminary teaching, our, our uh, eschatology, our numerology, or whatever theological persuasion you're kind of bent towards, David teaches us that the anointing only comes on what you fight with. And so I'm kind of a goofy person. I like to have a good time. My name's Mark. I like to party. Come on, somebody. And uh, last night we did party in here. It was like a six-hour service. It was BYOB, bring your own Bibles. Come on. And uh, we had a good time up in here. But uh, I'm going to tell some jokes today. We're going to have a good time. But uh, I do promise, I, I actually feel like God gave me a specific word for you, that this is a new season. It's a new chapter. And I feel like this is a word for all of you, but it's also a word for each and every one of you. It's a macro, but a micro word. I believe this is a season of victory. I believe that the next 12 months will be marked by decisive, exhaustive victory. It will parallel that of the book of Joshua, as Joshua gave, uh, God gave Joshua seven years of, uh, of great, some say the greatest streak of victory in the history of believers. That literally God would give him 31 kings, seven nations in seven years. He would give him the most desirable real estate in the known world of the time. He would give him 10,000 square miles of what would be uh, the most prestigious real estate, the park place, come on, the boardwalk of the known world. God would give between Africa and Europe uh, the most fertile, agriculturally rich land in the world, the land of Canaan. And God promised this land in Genesis 15 to a guy named Abraham. He said, one day, Abraham, 400 plus years from now, you're going to have descendants that are going to be in tyranny and slavery to a, to a godless pagan nation. But the day will come that I'll actually punish the nation that actually suppresses your people. And I'm going to give them a land they didn't work for, houses they didn't build, and vineyards they didn't plant. And the day will come that they'll go into this place. I'm going to give it to them as an inheritance. It's going to be a land flowing with milk, honey, and Chick-fil-A. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Hashtag Christian chicken. And he says this, that when you enter into this promised land, it's going to be a fruitful place. And I believe, listen to me, if we're doing a theology according to geography, here's just three lands that people live in. There's the land of Egypt, which is when you don't know the goodness of God. I believe that Egyptian living is is living for the slavery and the oppression of darkness. Some of you are here today, maybe you don't believe in God, you've never, maybe you've been to church your whole life, but you've never had a Jesus encounter. And you're wondering why, why do I hate the way I live, the, the habits that I do, why can't I break free from this cycle? And I want you to know that without King Jesus, we live under King Pharaoh. And there's people in the room that feel like my existence is a slavery to Egypt bondage. There's actually another category in here that you believe in God, you're going to heaven, but you live like hell. And that's wilderness living. For 40 40 years, four decades, God's people lived in the weeds of the wilderness. For four centuries, God's people lived in the slavery of Egypt. And I I read a study which really spurred this this idea that in 2007, a large uh, case study was done for Christians, not for, not for atheists, for Christians. And they pulled thousands of Christians, and here was, the, here was the data, is they said out of everybody that we surveyed that was a believer, they said only 11% of the church believed that they were living in their quote-unquote promised land. They said that 89% of believers said they didn't feel like they were living for their God-given purpose. They said they didn't feel like they were living for God's conviction for their life. You know what God's will is? It's his desire for you. It's his desire for your existence. And there's literally, this is wild, 11% of the church said, I am doing what God made me to do. 11%. And so last service, we talked about what is the problem, what's the breakdown and really, we, we, we kind of landed, if I could overview last service, and go, you can catch the podcast. I'm going to do three different messages today. Is that all right? It's more work for me, but it's, it's, come on, it's better for you, it's, especially if you're on staff. Come on. <laughs> this preacher keeps saying the same thing. <laughs> I know where he's going. Um, but I want you to know that, that I really do believe that he said the reason why we don't in- inherit the promises of God is because we're illiterate of the promise. You have to read his promises to know his promises. And not only do you need to read it, you need to talk about it. Not only do you talk about it, you got to meditate on it. Not only do you meditate on it, you got to, you got to do it. 
And knowing God's will is not, as, is, is not doing God's will. And maturity, you can write this down, maturity is not how much you know about God, it's how much what you know about him that you live out. Some people say wisdom travels with age. No, sometimes age travels by itself. And being in church your whole life makes you a mature Christian, like having an oven in your home makes you a great baker. It can help, but it isn't evidence by itself. Come on. Owning a vacuum doesn't make you clean. Come on, somebody. And owning a Bible doesn't make you mature. Going to Bible college does not make you, come on, somebody. Going to seminary, seminary does not make you. Can I preach this morning? And uh, I'm going to have a good time today, uh, but uh, this is a long intro, but I, I promise we're going to go somewhere. If you got your Bible today, I want to I read uh, some passages out of this. Last tr- service was the promised land that God wants to give you, a land of victory. And how do you get, what's, what's the promise, or what's the problem to get the promises? I talked about that. This service, I want to talk to you about who's the promised land for. Who's it for? Are you ready? Who, 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 who's qualified to live a life that's better than they deserve? Who's qualified to marry someone that's better looking than you are, more godly than you are? Who's qualified to, go, to get a job that's beyond your education? To make a difference in the world that's beyond your, your IQ? Who, 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 who deserves the promised land? And I want to talk today about, about who God's promised land is for. Is that all right? And if you're uh, taking notes today, the title of this talk is You're Picked. You're Picked. You can write it first. I'm picked if you want to write it that way. Uh, Chapter 2 of the book of Joshua. Let's read a few verses together. I think I'm going to read about 10 verses this this morning. I want you to throw up on the screen for me, guys. It says in Joshua chapter 2, we're reading about a a lady that actually had an unusual vocation, uh, kind of a crazy vocation, a little bit awkward to talk about in church. Uh, She was a woman of the night, to say it kindly. And uh, her name was uh, Rahab, which is unfortunate because it sounds a lot like rehab. And um, just a tough go. She's mentioned eight times in the scriptures. Five of those times, she's referred to Rahab the prostitute. And so this lady has a pretty checkered past, as you can imagine, but a pretty unusual story. And we're going to read about it today. Chapter 2, verse, verse 1. If you're there, say, I'm ready. I'm gonna, uh, if you're new to church today, in the next 23 minutes, I'm going to read a few verses. I'm going to pray. I'm going to tell some stories. If you laugh, we call them jokes. If you don't laugh, it's just a story. Um, and then I'm going to actually uh, bring it into what we read here this morning. And then at the end of this message, here's the good news. We're not just studying God today. We're going to experience him. God's going to speak to some of you. And uh, God's going to heal some of you physically today, mentally today. And there's actually someone in here that you hated church your whole life. And in like 25 minutes, your entire disposition towards God is going to change. Because the same God that hardens clay softens butter. And I feel like God's going to soften some hard hearts today by the goodness of his love. You believe it? Say amen. Amen. Someone's back is going to get healed today. Someone's triceps going to get healed today. And there's someone in here that you have like a bone that's broken in your thumb area in your hand. God's going to heal that today. And I'm just excited about it. Everyone said, oh, yeah. A good day. Chapter 2, verse 1, it says this. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men. How many? He was smart because he was two of 12 that were sent into the promised land. He's like, if I'm in charge, we're only sending two guys. Those 10 idiots got us in trouble. <laughs> Appreciate that we're in Texas. You get these jokes. <laughs> California's like, what's that, what's, a, what's that special? What's that mean? <laughs> All right, we'll keep going. So they go to the grove here secretly saying, go view the land, especially, especially Jericho. So they went and came out to the house of a harlot named Rahab, lodged there, pretty dangerous, and it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, two men have come here by night from the children of Israel to search out our country. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase a few verses. The king sends some police officers, goes to Rahab's house. Where are the spies? Where are these guys at? Where are these, where are these Jews at? And Rahab's like, they're not here. They've already left. Go chase them. You'll catch up to them. In the meantime, she hid them on a roof in some, uh, in some, uh, some bushes on a roof. And uh, these guys were hidden out. So after they leave, we pick up reading here. I think it's in verse, uh, do we have the verses, guys? I think it's verse, um, there, there we go, verse 8. Now, there, therefore, lay down. She kept them uh, on the roof. And it says this. She said to the man, I know. Watch what she says. I, say with me, I I want you to know that in life, there's way more than you don't know than you do know. We have 66 books, 1,189 chapters of what we know about God. But there's still way more that we don't know than we do know. 
But faith lives in that phrase. Say it with me. I, I love this. I know personally that the Lord has given you this land. She's a prostitute that lives in the, in the land, by the way. She, she, she knows. I know, and the terror of all of you has fallen on us that the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you guys. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea until you came through Egypt, and what you did with the two kings of the Amorites who are on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, as soon as we heard, as soon as we I want to make mention of this, that God does not punish people that haven't heard. Everyone heard the same thing that Rahab heard. We heard all these things, and it goes on. Our hearts begin to melt. Neither did there remain any courage in anybody because of you. For we know that the Lord, your God, he is. He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me this day, since I have shown you kindness, you've spared your life, that you'll also show my kindness to me, to my father's house, and give me a true token, and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, uh, some of my sisters, Come on, just kidding. <laughs> and all they have, and deliver our lives from, come on, from death. So the men answered and said, our lives for your lives, none of this business. If you don't tell anybody, it shall be that when the Lord gives us this land, that we will deal kindly and truly with you. We will die, deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window from her house that was on the city wall. She dwelt, lived on the, the wall. And she said to them, go to the mountain lest these pursuers uh, Find you, hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterwards, you may go your way. So the men did, said to her, we will be blameless of this oath, which you have made us swear. Um, and it goes on, unless when we come into the land, you bind a line of scarlet cord from your window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, your sisters, all of them, into your father's household, in your own home. And it goes, if you do this, we'll, we got a deal. If you don't do this, Whoever's not in your house, we're not responsible for. And uh, I want to pray this morning. And again, I want to talk to you today about who's the land for. God, I just pray, next several moments, you'd speak to us, meet us where we are. We love you so much, Jesus. We give you today, in Jesus' name, everyone said amen. amen. Who remembers growing up at recess, experiencing either the high high or the low low of being picked for a sport? I don't know if there's anything that creates more insecurity in a non-athletic, come on, playing dodgeball with giants. I lived in the hood, man, so there were some athletic kids. And um, I was a little bit late. I didn't really bloom until like six months ago. <laughs> and so I didn't always get picked first. I was usually like a little bit lower on the totem pole. It's not about being picked though, man. It's not about being like wanted on the team. There's always that one kid that just like dominates everything. And, and you know, the, the two, you picked, we know the, we know the drill, two team captains. All right, Joey, you and Bruce, you're captains. So Joey's like, all right, I got, I want, I want Gemini. All right, Gemini's picked, right? And then, uh, and then Bruce is like, I'll take, uh, I'll take Hightower. These <laughs> names are, these names are funny, man. And they start picking, it's like the most big, athletic, amazing, fast, high jumpers. They all get picked first. And then the rest of us leftovers. Just sitting there, you know, lip quivering. <laughs> I have something to contribute. Um, just sitting there waiting to be picked. Being picked, man, it's an awesome feeling. It's, it's, it's a great, I remember I, I went from a big school in the, in the hood to a, a smaller school in a little bit nicer neighborhood. And the kids were way less athletic. And I went from being picked last to almost like top three every time. They'd be like, man, we want Mark. I'm like, that's right. <laughs> About time. Appreciate it. And uh, being picked is awesome. I love being, I love that feeling of being wanted, being chosen, being selected. It's funny, man, because um, isn't, it, isn't it like, it'd be kind of cool, we can't do this, but it'd be kind of cool if you could actually pick your parents I don't know if you ever thought about this before. I thought it'd be pretty awesome, man. Because if you could pick like the, the person, the personality, the persona, the, the genes, right, the, the life, if you could select, can you imagine how fun it would be if it was like a video game that you're lining out like, man, I want, all right, I want to look like Brad Pitt. Come on. Brad, I'm going to inherit your looks, but you're going to be like Bill Gates. 
but you're going to be athletic like LeBron James. We start putting this genetic pull together that, come on, you start like, man, this is going to be a great life. It'd be amazing if you could pick, man, you could hand select who were the people that would bring you into the world. If you could say, man, they're going to be pastors, though. They're going to love God, but they're going to, they're going to have a 65-inch vertical leap. They're going to run a two-flat 40, and I'm going to have just phenomenal genetics. If you could pick. Now, I'm amusing some of you guys, but I want you to know that, unfortunately, we know the story that no one can pick their families. And that's, that's, that's evident in the fact that all of us have some family members that are weird. Can we all say an honest amen? And if you don't have a weird family member, just pretend that you do. We'll all get suspicious. He's weird. We don't pick our families. There's actually, uh, truth be told, there's never been anyone that's been able to pick their family, except one. There's only one person in history that had the opportunity to select whoever he wanted to be in his family tree. Probably the most boring chapter, if you don't think about it this way, in the Bible, Matthew chapter 1, outside of the book of Leviticus. And Matthew 1 talks about the family tree of Jesus Christ. And one of the craziest things to me is the people that he put in his family. Now, if it was me, again, I'm stacking. It's like, and LeBron begot, you know, Kyrie, and Kyrie begot, you know, (laughs) Dak Prescott, and Dak Prescott begot. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it would just be like this lineage of just stacked genes. But it's amazing that you read the lineage of Jesus, and there's like, there's like non-Jews in it, which is a big no-no. And not only is there non-Jews, there's actually, there's actually a woman of the night that made the lineage of Jesus. Hey, Jesus, did you forget you're God? You can pick anybody. And it seems like he's picking the last people first. And uh, it's crazy because uh, I love Joshua 2. It's a book of, of con- conquest. But the wildest part is, is before they go in and conquer 31 31 kings, seven nations. The first stop in, is Jericho. And before they conquer the city, he sends in two spies, which actually turn out to be two missionaries. I don't believe that God sent two spies because I think God already knew what was going to happen in Jericho. I think that he sent two people because he picked Rahab. I think God actually had a love for everybody, but Rahab was the only one smart enough to respond to it. I actually believe that we read the story, we're like, man, how could God do this? If you read Genesis 15, 16, it says that God gave this wicked nation that sacrificed their babies in fires, that involved, engaged with bestiology and sacrificed virgins, and the most pagan humanity to ever live the earth, live on the earth, was these nations and these kingdoms. They were, they were unredeemable cultures. But God loved all of those people. I believe, are you following me? He loved all those people. And they walked in. I know they loved the people because everyone in the cities knew that he was God. We know because Rahab said, all of us know that your God is the God. I know, though, that when you come here, God's given you this land. And when he gives it to you, I want to make a deal. And I believe that God did not send spies. He sent missionaries. And when he sent missionaries in, this only, the only person that heard it Because here's what I've learned. All of us can hear the same thing today, but it's what you do with what you hear that changes your reality. You you ever notice you go to church service and this guy's crying, changes his life, stops, stops all of his addictions, starts serving God, changes the world, and the guy sitting right next to him heard the same message, sang the same songs. And left, went on to cheat on his spouse, get a divorce, get addicted to drugs, and up taking his life prematurely. How could two people in the same space Go completely different directions. Could I suggest to you, it's not what you know, it's what you do with what you. Rahab goes, huh? Like, I know, like, God's with you. Like, he, he opened up a mile-wide river, and three million of you guys walked through it on dry ground. I heard about 40 years before that how the Red Sea opened up, and you guys walked through it on dry. I heard how God gave the most powerful military on the earth and swallowed it in the middle of the ocean. I heard. Heard how God made a promise to Abraham and that you guys are inheriting it. 
And that in 430 years, 45 people turned into 3 million people. And you're here because God's giving you this land. So what do we know about the story? If I could summarize a little bit of this, is I love this because um, there's, there's this crazy, uncanny, uh, this mystery to me, that they go into the city and there was two missionaries that made a deal with Rahab. I want you to know that Rahab is to the Old Testament what the Samaritan woman is in the New Testament. John chapter 4, there's a lady that was married, divorced five times, shacked up with number six. And it says that Jesus needed to go to Samaria. What did you need to go to Samaria for? It's because he picked a Samaritan woman to be a, a vessel of his honor. And in Joshua chapter 2, it says that he actually needed to send two spies into the land. They have... They have a uh, discussion with one person who is a prostitute who is actually by the law of Moses worthy to be punished by death. But the craziest part is, is there's, just a, there's, a, there's a deal made. Is they said, all right, our lives for your lives, here's what you got to do. You got to put a, red sco- uh, re- a scarlet cord out your window. And when we get here, if whatever window has the scarlet thread outside of it will spare that house. I, I want to let you know that if I was her, I would have been checking the tight, how tight that knot was every day. Anybody else? And the weird part is this, is a couple things I want to just point out to you about Joshua 2, is God says, I want you not to siege the city. I actually want you to get the presence of God, walk around the city with the military, one time a day for six days, seventh day, seven times, and then shout. But be quiet while you do it, otherwise you'll talk yourself out of the victory. So just be quiet, because... You'll start asking questions. Why aren't we using siege tactics? Joshua is no longer a 30-year-old, naive, greenhorn military leader. He's now a seasoned general. And God does not tell him to siege the city. He says, march around it one time a day quietly. Could I suggest to you, why in the world would they do a parade for six days around a pagan city that, that God loves? I wonder if God actually allowed everybody that was on the wall looking through their windows to see the military marching around, and they all knew that God was with them because he actually wanted them to have six nights to sleep on his grace. I wonder if every day they saw marching around, they go, man, are we going to turn to God? Are we going to trust in God? Are we going to, we have a choice. We have three choices. There's three choices you make. Same today as it is then, right? Three choices they had to make. They could actually, number one, they could surrender and go, hey, um, we're going to be like the Gibeonites. We want to make a deal. Like, we'll serve you guys. Just don't kill us. Number two, they could have relocated and said, hey, take the land. We're gone. God's with you. God bless you. Take it. We'll, we'll, we'll find somewhere else to settle. Or number three, they could fight. And I love the fact that um, God would give them six days to sleep on his grace. Every day they saw him marching around the city. This is not psychological warfare. This is God's extended mercy. A couple other points I want to make. There is no limitation on how many people would be saved that were in the house. There was no given by the spies. The spies said, hey, only seven of you can be spared. God, God told through the spies, as many people that are in your house will be saved. If you can fit the whole city in your house, so be it. And by the way, there was no uh, disclosure, disclosure on how many scarlet cords could be used. They just said any window that had a cord outside of it will be spared. I believe God would have honored 10,000 scarlet cords. I believe God would have spared the entire, are you following me today? He is the God that is rich in mercy. But for some reason, everybody heard the message. Only one person believed, man, God loves me. God can spare me. And here's where the story gets really crazy as the band comes up here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray here in a second. Is the story gets wild because uh, as the spies are going down the window, there is an in- interchange of discussion. And the wildest part of the story is, is there is no recording of the spies putting a prerequisite of a lifestyle change, a vocational change. There's no documentation that, hey, you have to change your profession for us to spare your life. And could it be that your profession of faith is more important than your profession? And they're looking at each other and and they just said, hey, whoever's in your house, put the cord outside your window. The red cord represents the blood of Jesus. And when that blood covers your home, everyone that's in that home, they're covered. There's too many parallels to ignore this, but the blood, like, just like the Passover lamb, whatever red cord covers 
is, is under the blood. And we find here in the story that there's a, it's pretty wild, is there's no inter, inter, exchange about vocational change. We know that God would have honored as many cords as would have hung out the window. But it's just wild to me that there's no record of anything changing. But the weird part is in chapter, uh, if you could put it up, guys, chapter 6 of Joshua, it doesn't say they just spared her life when they came. We know the story, the walls came down. Everyone in the whole place was just completely destroyed, except one house along the wall was still standing with one lady and all of her loved ones in the house. And this is where the story gets really interesting to me, is they're all spared. And again, by the law of Moses, prostitutes should have been stoned to death. So the fact that she wasn't killed on site for her vocation is kind of an anomaly. But the weird part is it doesn't say that she just survived the incident. It actually would go on and say that Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household and all that she had. Chapter 6, verse 25. And she dwells, so she dwells. The writer of this book, while he's living, years later writes, so she dwells amongst Israel to this day. Because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out the land. She lives here until this day. And apparently this girl doesn't just live on the outskirts of Israel. She's not just some like, like, like low life, like, like bottom dweller in Israel. Because she would go on as a non-Jew to marry into the Jewish nation. Which was an anomaly. And she doesn't marry anybody. She marries a pretty solid guy by the name of Salmon. Solomon was uh, actually a distinguished Jewish leader, and they would actually have a romantic marriage. They would give birth to a little boy, and they would name this little boy's name Boaz. Boaz may be inspired by his parents' story of mercy and, 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 and rich compassion, actually sees a Moabite girl by the name of Ruth. Ruth would go on to become the daughter-in-law of this woman named Rahab. In time, they would have another son, they would name this son, and then the next son would be named Jesse. And, and Jesse would become the son of, of, of uh, the grandson of Boaz, and the great grandson of Rahab would be Jesse, and the great, great, great grandson of Rahab would be King David. And it's crazy that a prostitute that deserved death would go on to be the prognoti prognosticator to actually the greatest dynasty in the history of humanity. She would be known no longer as Rahab the prostitute, but in time, she would be remembered as Rahab the mother of kings. Solomon would come from her lineage. David would come from her lineage. Hezekiah would come from her lineage. But ultimately, not just kings, but the king of kings would come out of her lineage, her story. Because listen to me. The message of Jesus Christ is, is that those that don't deserve his promises actually have the ability to inherit them. Grace is only grace when there's nothing equivalent of value to earn it. The moment you can earn something that's equivalent, it's no longer grace. And here's what we know. That day she gave up everything except what she brought in her house. But you know what the story is? Is the same then as it is today. That what you give up to receive God is always far less than you get from him. In the end, Rahab got way more than she gave up. And I am living proof today that God will always give you more than you give up. He is a God that is rich in mercy. He is kind. He is strategically kind to even the most uh, unstrategic animals. The book of Job talks about ostriches. God loves the ostriches. It's like, dear God, there is nothing good about ostriches. They're the stupidest animal on the earth. And God says, look at the ostrich. I love the way that it runs. God has a love for even the least strategic human. Look at the way that he runs. Look at the way that he talks. Look at the way that she's kind. Mark, who deserves God's love? No one. Who's earned his forgiveness? But here's what I know is three things. You can write these down and we'll pray. God's promise, you know who it's for? It's for forgiven people. Rahab probably has the greatest story, maybe in the Bible, of redemption. That not only did God forgive me, he let me be in his family. 
He's the only one that picked his family members, friends. And God goes, I'm not going to forgive you. I'm going to put you. You're my, my lineage. You're, my, you're going to be on Ancestry.com one day. And you're going to Google space bar send, right? Holy cow. How did you make it in my family? How did I come from you? I want you to know today, friend, that the promises of God are for the, those that don't deserve them. And the promised land is not for perfect people. It's for forgiven people. I'll say it again. The promised land is not for perfect people. It's for forgiven people. Is there anybody here that would like to be forgiven of something you don't deserve? And it's not just for forgiven people. Rahab would tell us it's not just forgiven people. It's for people that are accepted. Because she wasn't just forgiven. Hey, you're forgiven, but stay out on the outskirts. Don't you show your face on church. You stay out of the courts of God. You stay on the out. Don't you talk to Jewish people. Don't you make eye contact with God's people. She wasn't just forgiven, friends. She was accepted. You know who the promised land belongs to? It doesn't just belong to forgiven people. It belongs to people that have been accepted. The Bible says that we're accepted in the beloved. That means that God doesn't just love you. He accepts you. And we know this from Jesus, that long before Jesus does any miracles, God is proud to call him his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Before you do anything for God, God loves you. We can say it like this, that long before you're proud to call God your father, he's proud to call you his son or daughter. He is a God that is rich in mercy. Hey, Rahab, you're not just forgiven, baby. You're, you're accepted. And you're not just accepted. Guess what? You're, number three, you're loved. You know who this good news belongs to? It belongs to loved people. And I want you to know that you could have all the, the sayings of the scripture and memorize every verse of the scripture. If you use scripture without love, you're actually, you're, it's like scripture without the love of script, the, the love of Jesus. Citing scripture without love is like throwing yourself a surprise birthday party. It's counterintuitive. And there's many people that stand at sporting events with scriptures on their signs from the Old Testament that say you're going to hell, that you stink, that God's frustrated and, and sick of you but I want you to, you can cite scriptures but you can cite it without the spirit of the scriptures the Bible says that everything that's of God is born of, of God it's, it's born out of love and love overcomes the world I feel like someone here needs to know this day who is heaven made for it's made for forgiven it's made for accepted and it's made for love people well if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds you get in that's not the way it works Sounds good, but it's not the way it works. Heaven is for people that have been forgiven. The Holy Spirit comes to forgiven people, accepted people, loved people. Thanks for listening to the Church 1132 broadcast. You can join us live every Sunday during our worship experience or at church1132.com.